Warning, some contents may be disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. This happened a couple of years ago. I'm a 26-year-old female, and I was walking my dog, Indy, in my local field. It was dark, but it wasn't late. It was winter time in the UK, so maybe around 6 p.m. The field is mainly used for rugby or football, but is completely free to walk through whenever. It is also surrounded by houses and streetlights on the roads, but the field itself is dark. So, I had brought a torch with me, mainly so I didn't trot in any dog shit. I've come in in one entrance of the field, and I'm following a path that leads to another exit or entrance. I use the field to make a loop back around onto the road and then back to my house, giving my dog some off-lead time whilst in the field. Anyway, as I'm walking up in the field, I notice a figure in the exit or entrance that I was going to use to leave. I keep my eye on this figure as they have very dark clothing on and their hood is up. I'm shining my torch as I'm walking so I know the person knows that I'm there as it's very obvious. At first, I wasn't really nervous, more so just being vigilant. Indy is a wonderful German shepherd, so as you can imagine, I feel pretty safe with her. It wasn't until I saw the person duck down behind a bush or tree that I absolutely froze. There's a lot of new trees or bushes planted sporadically up the part of the field that isn't used for sports. I was about 200 feet from the exit, but would have to walk past the bush that they hid behind to get to it. I call Indy over and I get her back on the lean so she is close. And by this point, she is also hyper alert due to the person behind the bush. With that, I heard a weird, high-pitched voice that sounded like they were saying my dog's name. I assumed they heard me when I called her. And they said it three to four times in this longed-out high-pitched voice. It's clearly coming from the person hiding. Luckily, Indy wasn't reacting to it as it probably barely sounded like her name to her. I had a moment of, shall I fight or flight? Either I, one, run past the bush and try for the exit. Two, turn around and run back into the dark field and make for the other exit which is a lot further away. Or three, confront this motherfucker. Indy at this point is hackles up, ears up and very alert in front of me, all while still maintaining a wonderful sense of calm. Well, I went with number three. I confronted that weirdo. I mustered up every bit of courage and confidence that I had and I shouted at the top of my voice. What the hell are you doing? The hooded man came out of the bush very quickly without saying anything, and I said the same thing again. What the hell are you doing trying to scare a young woman? I'm so glad my voice didn't shake or break when I said it, as I really was terrified at this point. He started to stutter and then said, Oh, oh, I thought you were someone I knew. I answered back and said, Who the hell hides from someone they think they know in a dark field? After that, he apologized a couple times and continued the rest of the field, and I made for a swift exit with Indy. God knows what his intentions were. Maybe he thought I had a smaller dog, and he was going to try and attack me. Maybe he saw Indy and realized that he had no chance. Or maybe... He really did think that I was someone he knew. Whatever it was, it was weird and scary. For a bit of context, I need to explain how transportation works in the area where I live. So, where I live, the public transportation is absolute shit. There is only one not very reliable public bus 
that takes you in and out of the residential area and is a long way walking. So, the people in this residential area came up with a cab sort of system where you pay by the seat. So, one of these cabs fits up to four people. And a little under a year ago, they decided to identify these cabs with a sticker with a number that states that the car is part of the cab line. Also, that the drivers have to have an ID that has the cab line info. Now, on to the story. A couple of times, men have tried to give me a ride and I do my best to ignore them, but sometimes it's a little bit scary. The part of the residential area where I live is a little bit isolated, so not a lot of cars or people go through there, and I have to walk alone from my house to the cab line or bus stop. In one opportunity a couple of months ago, I was walking from my house to the stop, and I was wearing headphones, so I wasn't paying that much attention. First mistake on my part, really. A car pulled over next to me, and this wasn't all that strange because I have been using this cab line for a while, and a lot of drivers know me, and if they see me, they just pull over so I don't have to walk all the way to the stop. The driver said, Hey, are you going to... Then mentions a place of destination. I said yes, and I got inside the car without checking the windshield for the ID number, which is the second mistake on my part. Here is where alarms started going off in my head. First, the cars in the line tend to be older cars with no AC. And this was a newer car. When I got in, he locked the doors and then turned on the AC. In this point, I finally realized that this wasn't one of the cabs, but a complete stranger. He began to ask me things like my name, exactly where I lived, and other personal things. I responded very vaguely with my heart beating really fast. I was starting to panic, so I texted a friend my location and I told him to call me ASAP. At this point, we were close to the destination and this guy was not slowing down the car and was about to pass the stop. Then, the call came through and I started to talk to my friend like he was my boyfriend. I said, Hi baby, I'm almost there. Wait for me and then we'll go, okay? My friend was really confused, but when the man heard my conversation, he suddenly stopped the car saying, Oh, sorry. I was so entertained talking to you that I almost passed the stop. Maybe we could see each other again. And then he unlocked the car, and I bolted out barely saying anything. After that day, I became more aware of my surroundings, and I tend to only get inside the cabs in the stop unless I clearly see the ID on the car. A couple of my friends said, that I was just overreacting, but still, it scared the shit out of me. Then, today comes. I was walking from my house to the stop, no headphones in this time, and when I'm halfway there, a car starts driving slowly next to me. I keep on walking, and the older man that was driving starts talking to me. He says, Are you Alicia's daughter? Do you live around here? I responded no, that I'm not, and I keep on walking. He insisted saying that he was a neighbor and that he could give me a ride. I replied again that I wasn't and that I didn't want the ride. Mind you, my mom wasn't called that and has been dead for over a decade, and my grandma that people sometimes confuse as to be my mom is not called that either. He kept insisting and I began walking faster, approaching the stop where there were more people. At this point, the man became angry and started to yell saying that this was the last time that he would be nice to me and then offer me a ride. Then he sped up and left. Finally, I got to the stop to get inside a cab that left in my destination. When I got to work, I told my boss and she said, Ah. Oh, Thank God you kept on walking. You could have been kidnapped. 
Well, yeah, that was my morning. I really need a car. To both those creeps that maybe wanted to kidnap me, or who knows what, let's not meet. I have a story that is probably one of the most disturbing things to have ever happened to my family. I say my family because it was more so my grandparents, but it's something that has been kind of held close to all of us since it happened. All of this happened on my grandparents' property, and my grandpa was even looked at as a suspect for a moment, but was eventually cleared for the whole thing. Even still... This whole event was devastating for my grandfather, for reasons that will be obvious in a little while. I do need to give a small bit of context, so bear with me while I detail a few things. This happened quite a long time ago. My dad was still in his teens when this took place, so it was way before my time. My grandparents lived in the northwestern part of the US, and they owned a decent amount of land there. It all belonged to my great-great-grandfather, and had been passed down twice at this point to my grandfather, Ronald. On the land that they owned, in the southern corner, complete opposite of my grandparents' actual house, was a small cabin that, way back, was where the hired help on the land lived. By the time my grandfather got the land, the cabin was empty, and was used more for storage than anything. Still, they kept it up, and made sure that if anyone ever wanted or needed to stay in the cabin, they could. My grandfather kept the land around it tidy, and kept it up on the maintenance of the building. It is important to mention that this cabin, being on the opposite end of the property, was nowhere near the house. In order to get to the cabin, you would have to get on the road, circle around the property until you hit the south end and then pull up the driveway to get to it. In the fall of 1965, my grandfather's cousin, Walter, a man that helped raise my grandfather because they were separated by about 12 years, came to visit my grandpa, and asked him if he could stay in the cabin for a little while. Apparently, Walter had, in his words, fallen on hard times, and needed somewhere to stay for a couple of months. My grandfather didn't ask him any questions about what had happened, because Walter was family, and he said that Walter was welcome to stay for as long as he needed. Obviously, my grandpa was suspicious that something was going on, that Walter had done something illegal or questionable, because he'd been in with some questionable people in the past, but again, he was family, and my grandpa never questioned family or left them in the cold. He was a man that didn't say much, but he was very loyal to those that he knew and loved, because that's how he was raised. A few weeks passed, and Walter had set up his home in the cabin. My grandfather went over to visit with him a few times over the first week to see how he was doing. Walter seemed a bit nervous at first, but as the first month came and went, he seemed a lot more comfortable and less on edge. Again, Red flags, I know, but my grandfather was confident that Walter would be able to handle whatever it was. He did ask him if he should be worried for himself and his wife at one point, but Walter told him that everything was fine, and that he would just be there a few months until things settled down, and then he would be out of his hair. Again, questionable comments being made there, but in the end... My grandpa just said that Walter was free to stay as long as he needed, told him where the ammo for the hunting rifle in the cabin was, then went back home to my grandmother and my father. A couple more weeks passed, and my grandpa hadn't heard much from Walter. And that Saturday, he decided he would take the trip around to see how he was, and to ask if he wanted to help with some work that he needed to do. He pulled his truck up to the cabin, and immediately felt like something was off. Walter's car wasn't in the driveway, but the door to the cabin was wide open. My grandpa thought initially that Walter had to take off in a hurry and left the door open. 
Obviously, this bothered him, but it would have been the better alternative to what did end up happening. My grandpa walked up to the cabin and called out for his cousin, but there was no response. Then, he walked in. He knew immediately that something horrible had happened. My grandfather always described what he saw as a scene straight out of his worst nightmares. The furniture in the cabin was overturned and destroyed. One of the windows was shattered, with the glass on the inside of the cabin, meaning it had been broken in, and the air was thick with that coppery scent of blood. There was a massive dark stain on the carpet in the living room, and a trail that led from there out the back door of the cabin, like the person that was bleeding had been dragged out of the cabin. Then, he noticed the large, bloody knife that was stabbed into the cabinet, pinning a piece of paper to it. And my grandfather's blood turned cold as ice when he read it. Sorry about your cabin, Ronald. This wasn't personal, and we have no beef with you. Don't bother trying to find him. We were told to take care of him, and to make him disappear. So he did. My grandpa said that those words were like a cold hand around his heart, that they made him feel sick to his stomach when he read them. He panicked and started shouting for Walter, but he knew deep down that there wasn't going to be a response. Whoever Walter had messed with had taken care of business, and that was the end of it. Grandpa raced back home and called the authorities, telling the cops that he thought that someone had been murdered in the cabin. Their investigation ended up yielding more questions than answers. Of course, back then, forensics wasn't exactly a super complex thing. The only clue was the blood, the knife, and the note. And Walter was never found, dead nor alive. A fact that hovered over my grandfather for probably the rest of his life. The cabin was a crime scene for a while, the officers and investigators coming through every once in a while to try to find clues, or to ask my grandfather questions, but after a little while it was released back to him to do with as he pleased. My grandpa ended up moving all of his tools and everything he needed out of the cabin. It burned everything else in it, and then boarded up the husk that he left behind. He wanted to demolish it, but he never did. I think that it haunted him too much to do so. Like, he wanted to, but then kept telling himself that maybe Walter would come back. The only time that I went out to that side of the property as a kid, my father told me the story of what happened, and I saw that the building had pretty much been destroyed by nature, overgrown, wood rotting out, and so forth. My uncle ended up taking over the land, as my father had moved out of state, so he offered it to him instead, when both my grandparents had passed away. My uncle did end up demolishing the old cabin, so there's nothing left there now but the memories of what happened. As of today, Walter's case is obviously on ice. No evidence, no new leads, and everyone involved is probably gone by now. But whatever ended up happening to Walter, based on the state of that cabin, I have to imagine that it wasn't quick, nor painless. I'm currently an 18-year-old female, but this situation happened in 2021, and at that time I was 16. It was afternoon, at around 3.30 p.m., I was returning home from my classes, and at that time, there was a high spread of COVID-19, so school was happening online. But I had no other options than to go take some notes from my teacher, as there was an important exam coming. Normally, I wasn't allowed to go outside because my knowledge of roads and areas were pretty poor, but my teacher's house was about three kilometers away and on the same route as our old apartment, so they let me. On the way there, there's this Fuchka stall where I knew the shopkeeper since childhood. For those who don't know, 
Fuchka is a popular, affordable, and delicious snack in our country. While I was walking home from my teacher's place, after fetching the notes, I decided to snack on some of those fuchka and have a chat with the kind shopkeeper. The roads were kind of empty at that time, and most of the shops were closed. Only a few passerbys were here and there too. As I was eating, I felt someone touch my hair suddenly from behind, which startled me. I had my hair as a ponytail at that time, and when I turned around, it was an old woman who looked homeless, probably in her 60s or early 70s, smiling at me. She asked me if I could buy her the snacks, and at that time, I kind of felt awkward, but I didn't know how to deny her, so I just said yes, even though I didn't carry enough money. I just asked the kind shopkeeper to give her my part of the snack that was left. I didn't really mind this, but when I started to leave, she grabbed my right hand tightly and said, Ah, God bless you, child. If I could see my granddaughter, she would be just like you. And something like that. I was awkwardly smiling and nodding at that time because I felt uncomfortable. I did try to pull my hands away from her grip politely, but she didn't budge at all. She then started talking about how she raised her daughter and son and how her alcoholic but rich husband used to beat both of them up and pretty much assault them and how she kept silent about all of it because of the money. And later on, when her children grew up, got a job, and got married, her husband got into gambling and lost all of his money. He then went into debt and died of a liver failure. Now, she was helpless. She went to her children, but they resented her because they were greedy, so they didn't help her as they were happily settled in their lives. She told me how she lost everything and other shit for the next two hours. I did sympathize with her, but at the same time, I had to return home because I was too late. The woman had a very eerie body language. She later on asked me about where I lived, and, dumb me at that time, told her about that. She asked my dad's name, so I told her, and she said that she knew him, and started saying things like how he was a nice man. It wasn't a surprise to me, as my dad is popular around our locality, as he's a helpful person who participates in charity work and things like that. So, I don't know what came into me when I asked her for a description of my dad, and she literally described him in total opposite. She just described my physical characteristics, but the thing is, I look like my mother, and me and my dad don't have similar body skin color, or even height, even though I do have a smile and nose. I said okay, and I tried to pull away my hand, but she didn't budge again. And mind you, she was holding it for two hours straight, and while we were talking, she was kind of walking me towards the starting of this dark lane by the road. She now kept on talking about how she wanted to take me to her home and feed me some sweets. But that's when it clicked to me. She told me that she has lost her everything. So, how was she going to take me to her home, especially in that dark lane? I got so frightened that I told her that I needed to get back home or my parents would scold me and I actually started using a bit of force to free my wrist from her grip. And that's when she literally started dragging me towards the lane and she was like, no, no, you fed me snacks. Now you have to take my gift in return. I pulled my hand away from her grip with full force and I straight up ran home. I was breaking out in cold sweats as I reached home. And understandably, my parents were angry and confused as I reached home. They did understand what happened when I explained the whole situation to them. I was really scared at that time, but I truly feel guilty if she was genuinely a nice old woman. But 
It was her vibes. They were just creepy. Once, while I was at Walmart, I passed by a younger 20-something guy heading to the auto care section to grab something. As I'm scanning the aisle to look for what I needed and then consider the options, the guy walked into the aisle and right next to me. Conscious of how close we were, I stepped to the side to allow him more room while I considered which option to get. The guy started talking to me and ask which car organizer I would get. I looked at the options for car organizers and I started making suggestions based on what he was looking for. I don't work at Walmart, which was very obvious. He then asked me my name, which made me slightly uncomfortable because I did not know this dude. Something you should know about me is that I was raised to be polite, but I was polite to a fault. And I, uncomfortably, without thinking, gave up my first name. He then asked me how old I was, to which I replied my age, which was under 20 at that time, and I looked younger. He asked where I lived, and I felt very uncomfortable by this time, but again, polite to a fault. I said that I lived nearby, and he asked me where, so I quickly replied in town, trying to be careful not to say where. He then asked me where I worked, and at this point, I am extremely uncomfortable and aware of all the information that he now knew about me. I did not want to tell him where I worked, but he would know if I lied because I was clearly wearing a company shirt. I replied with just the general type of work it was, and then he asked where that was at, so I replied with an approximate time to get there, but overshot it on purpose. I did not mention the town name, as there were several branches of the company. This entire conversation happened within the matter of 20 to 30 seconds, barely enough time for me to process. He then attempted to make more conversation, and I either answered with very short replies or just slight chuckles to give off the idea that I did not want to talk. He finally said thanks and then walked away. I started texting my boyfriend like crazy because I was freaking out and I didn't know what to do. I'm a pretty small person, so it might seem as if I'm an easy target. So, I was standing in that aisle for the next few minutes talking over texts. Suddenly, the guy, who seemed very interested in what car organizer to get, came back and quickly put the car organizer down, smiled at me, and then left. He didn't even buy the organizer. It wasn't like a, oh, I shouldn't spend money on this, so I should just put this back. It was almost like he just had it as a prop and stopped needing it. Needless to say, I was very careful throughout the rest of the store and had a worker walking me to my car. This happened back in late 2020. I work at a hospital, but on the data entry side of things. So, most of the time, I was able to work from home, but I had to go in once a week for a mandatory meeting and to swap out or shred any documents that I may have had. Unfortunately, on this Thursday, I was due in the office, and we were expected to have a pretty heavy snowstorm. It was just a light dusting by the time I went in that morning, but I watched from my office window as my car was buried inch by inch in snow. By the time I was leaving for the day, it probably took me an extra 15 minutes to dig my car out. It was older, so I had to let it warm up, otherwise it wasn't going to go anywhere fast. But finally, I was on the road and headed home. I was living in a newly developed apartment complex, which meant there was a whole lot of nothing around the area. It was in a pretty busy city, but the side road to my apartment complex was all new, so it was a pretty long and boring road, typically. 
So, as I was coming home, I turned onto the old highway, thinking it would be easier to get through expecting the roads to have been cleared, or at least treated. As I drove, I could see a dark figure in the distance. It looked like someone was standing on the side of the road, possibly about to cross it. As I mentioned, I was on this little side highway that was a shoot-off from the larger and more heavily used one. So, seeing anyone out here on foot wasn't simply uncommon, it never happened. Especially not in these kinds of snowstorms. So, I slowed down, just in case they tried to cross in front of me. Visibility was down, so I didn't want to risk them not seeing me either. But as I got closer, it looked like the person wasn't moving. And I would soon learn why. As I approached, I slowed down next to it and saw not a person, but a scarecrow. I was definitely confused, but I guess more relieved that it wasn't a person standing out there. I remember chuckling to myself, but then continued on down the road. But that wasn't the end of the strangeness that night. This road had several curves, and the right shoulder was more of a cliff than a shoulder. There was a guardrail around it, but there was a steep incline behind it that it would probably stop you better than the barrier. So, as I drove around these curves, I saw another scarecrow, and another. I probably saw one around every curve, and it made no sense. This happened in December. I would expect to see maybe reindeers or other possible Christmas decorations, but not scarecrows. There wasn't even any agricultural land around this road, so they really made no sense. But as I drove by them, it started to become pretty eerie. The heavy snowfall and winds made it hard to see, and then spotting the dark and human-like scarecrows was kind of putting me on edge. Because I was getting nervous, I kept my speed lower than the limit, and kept looking along the sides for more of these scarecrows and hopefully an answer for it. However, I was clearly struggling with tunnel vision as I looked for them because, out of nowhere, there was a loud thud and a dark figure hit the front of my car. I was terrified. I slammed my brakes, which made me skid due to the conditions of the road, but thankfully I wasn't going the 45 plus miles per hour that the road called for, so I was able to get my car under control. After coming to a complete stop, I sat motionless, trying to catch my breath, when I noticed my cracked windshield. This brought me back to my surroundings and realized that I may have just hit a person. I got out of my car, now shivering, not from the cold, but out of fear. I look behind my car and I see a pile of what should be a body. Their back was to me, but the legs were bent backwards, and unnaturally so. They had clothes on, but from their position, I was certain they were dead. My heart was racing, and I felt like I was going to be sick, but I continued to walk towards them, shouting if they were okay. Yes, I asked if they were okay. I was scared, dumb, and I didn't know what else to say in this situation. But then, I got close enough and realized that something was wrong. Again, this was not a person. It was a mannequin. What the hell was going on here? There were random scarecrows everywhere, and then out of nowhere a mannequin falls from the sky and hits my car? I seriously felt like I was in some kind of movie, or someone had to be around recording this. I nudged the mannequin with my foot, and after confirming one more time that it was not a person, I started walking back towards my car. Then... The deafening silence of the snowfall was broken when I heard a shuffling sound from behind me. I turned around and saw a man sliding down the hill on the right. I stopped and watched as he walked towards the mannequin and started picking it up. Then he shouted back towards the hill, and two more people came out and slid down the hill toward him too. 
I was standing by my car at that point, ready to jump in and lock the doors. I started to fear that this was some kind of setup that I'd heard about online, where someone pretends to get hit by your car or maybe they claim they're broken down on the side of the road, and when you pull over, more people come out and try to rob you or something. They were all in big jackets and overalls, all wearing balaclavas, and had their hoods over their heads. I wouldn't even be able to give a description, so I was prepared to get in my car and just call 911. But I couldn't help but watch as the three of them started picking up the mannequin that was now in pieces under the clothes. The first guy then stopped to wave at me and said, Sorry about that. We're just trying to have a little fun. I just stared at them and gave them a limp wave back, and watched as they finished picking up the mannequin. One of them threw the head to another, and then they all marched back up the hill and out of view. What did I just witness? Was that really a couple of full-grown, I think, men, playing with a mannequin on the side of the road? I just got in my car, frowned again at the crack, and drove away. I was even more on alert at that point, looking all over the place and probably not going faster than 20, just to make sure that nothing else happened. And thankfully, I made it home shortly after with no other incidents and no other scarecrows seen. I locked the door to my apartment and kept looking around to see if anyone had followed me home. I don't know why that had me so paranoid. They definitely didn't seem like they were going for a robbery or something, I mean, after watching them walk away and not even approach me, but it still freaked me out. Were they really just doing that for fun? And what exactly were they trying to do? I definitely didn't want to stop and ask questions, and I surely wasn't going to tell them that they owed me a new windshield, even though I should have. I never did see them again on that road though I didn't leave my house again until that following week, I guess afraid of what or who might be out there. I even posted on the Nextdoor app to see if anyone else witnessed the same thing, but no one had similar experiences. I guess I was just the lucky winner that day. I still live in the same apartment, but I'm very suspicious about taking that road. So I got a dash cam, in case, god forbid, it does happen again. However, it seems like it was just a one-off thing, and their one-off day of fun has forever triggered a near panic attack any time I am on that road. This happened to me and my still current boyfriend about two years ago. We live in a city that has a main downtown area. The main city is pretty liberal, but once you get out into the county, it can become quite the opposite. That being said, the main city, and especially the downtown area, has a pretty bad homeless problem that's only gotten worse over the years. For the most part, the homeless population is pretty harmless. They know the good spots to hang out, and a lot of times, they just smile at you, and I always smile back, and then you go on your way. Sadly, there has been an increase of incidents in the last few years with the rise of overdoses and more addictive street drugs. I was living in the main downtown area at that time, having just recently graduated college and wanting to be close to the nightlife. My best friend that I met in college and I were roommates. We had an apartment right in the middle of downtown, and it was the perfect setup. My boyfriend, let's call him Jack, happened to live one block down, and then about five or six blocks out of that. It was about a ten minute walk, give or take, and it was even closer to the heart of downtown as well. So, as you can imagine, how convenient that made it for hanging out and also not having to take a car and worry about parking. On one overcast Sunday morning, my boyfriend and I woke up at my place and then we decided to walk over to his 
so that he could grab some things. We had walked the majority of the way, because it was really just a straight walk on the sidewalks the whole time. We were on the right side of the road, with the street to our left. We're not one minute from my boyfriend's place, when I noticed something I had that makes me feel a bit uneasy. First off, there's a guy walking in front of us in the same direction we are, with his back to us. I can see he has both earbuds in. He was walking at about the same pace, so we aren't about to run into him or anything. In front of him, facing and walking towards all of us, is a different guy. He had a small frame, was maybe 5 foot 8, wearing dark pants, a red sweatshirt with a hood up and a backpack. Even though his hood was up, I could see his face. Some short black hair poked out, pale skin, and these black beady crazy eyes that I will never forget. I assumed him to be homeless, as it was an area that was popular for them. Now, he wasn't looking at us, but rather the pedestrian with earbuds in who happened to be closer to him and in front of us. But all of a sudden, I see the homeless guy run and quite literally rushed the pedestrian in front of us, like ran up and then stopped about half a foot from this poor dude's face. Since the guy had his headphones in, he probably just wanted to mind his own business and walk home quietly. He was clearly taken by surprise and stopped and took one of his earbuds out to see what this crazy dude wanted. Me, while I'm a risk taker, I don't like putting myself in the wrong place when I don't need to be. This freaked me out and I didn't want the guy to notice us and then come at us next. So, I stepped left off to the sidewalk into the street. There was a pretty big lane for street parking and it was lined with parked cars. So, so I conveniently hid myself from view behind a car as I continued walking. I heard this guy start yelling obscenities at the poor pedestrian, things like, I'm gonna run you over with a car, I'm going to find you. And like I said, we were not a hundred feet from the entrance to my boyfriend's apartment at this point. And after witnessing that, I just wanted to be inside. My boyfriend had continued walking on the sidewalk, and in an instant, I had come back in view and we had turned right towards the apartment. Now, the apartment did have a main entrance from the street side on the sidewalk, but my boyfriend had just moved in and didn't have the code for the front door yet. All he had was his fob to the parking garage that led to the stairwell up into the place. We were using that at the time to get in. We walked up to the parking garage door and then clicked the button so it would start rolling up. I hadn't looked behind me at that point. I knew that I probably should have, but a lot of times, you just ignore the crazy people, and they will in turn not bother you. So I was kind of following that tactic at that moment. The garage door was open and then we went inside. My boyfriend clicked the button to close it, and we started the short walk to the door to the stairwell. The garage door was nearly closed, and I don't know what prompted me to look back, but I did. And what I saw still gives me the chills today. It was the homeless guy from the street. He was squeezing under the garage door while he still could, and I remember the chill that ran down my spine as I locked eyes with his, and I yelled at my boyfriend, Jack, he's following us! I'm not sure what I expected my boyfriend to do, but he pushed the door to the stairwell open and then started running. That was the, oh shit, moment when I realized that this guy had access inside because the door to the stairwell didn't require a fob or have a lock. Me, definitely not wanting to be the closest one to this guy, took off running after my boyfriend. As I pushed the door open and got inside the stairwell, I could hear the guy behind me 
doing the same as it was swinging back closed. I looked back, and I locked eyes with the crazy guy once again, and I was about to shit myself as I realized my only option was to keep running and try to get inside our apartment and then close the door before he got there. Yes, this guy was smaller, but what really freaked me out is since he had a backpack, I had no idea if he had a knife or a gun in there. And I meant shit, why else would you chase two people and outnumber yourself? My boyfriend lived on the third floor, so we proceeded to sprint up three flights of stairs. I could hear this guy's pounding footsteps behind me. And at last, we got to our level, opened up the door to the hallways, and sprinted to his unit without looking back. We then unlocked the door as fast as we could, and then slammed the door shut behind us. I remember looking through the peephole, and expecting to see this guy standing there, ready to yell at us, but nothing. My heart was pounding. I mean, what the hell just happened? We called the cops and told them what happened to us. I'll admit, they probably did all that they could, but it didn't feel like enough. I was freaked out. This dude now had access and was inside the building and had access to all the apartments and residents. I just imagined him hiding in the stairwell for the next poor soul. Well, the cops came, drove around the perimeter of the complex for a few minutes, and they weren't able to search inside the building because apparently they didn't have access in, and then they left after not finding anyone. It took me forever to get the urge to finally leave the apartment to go run our Sunday errands. But we did. I'm sure the guy was high on drugs and decided to be crazy that morning and bother some unlucky people. He probably left after he realized that he was screwed if people found him there and someone else called the cops. I live in the city. I don't want to give my exact location because it's a pretty prominent city in the US, but it's also expensive. I think city life is the best and I can't ever imagine living in the country or in the suburbs somewhere. I live, work, and I guess you could say that I play out here. The area in the city that I'm in is known for having an active nightlife and it isn't uncommon to see other people out at all hours of the night or early morning. You could say that I'm a fitness nut, so I go out to the local park for a jog nearly every single morning. I love getting out there for exercise. You know the stereotype that things only really happen at night, right? I didn't think things would happen at around 8 to 9 a.m. There were people around walking their dogs or going to work or school, and despite things happening in other parts of the city, it is unthinkable for where I live. Anyway, there were supposed to be groups of men following women alone at around 8 to 9 a.m. I've never been the type of person to let someone force me out of something that I enjoy. So I decided to go for walks late at night with a friend or a couple of friends at a time. I organized with her at a local corner store. Perfect. I headed off and I waited. It isn't uncommon for her to be late, but I had been waiting at around 11 p.m. for around 30 minutes. I tried calling and texting her to make sure that she was okay. And on the fifth try, she told me she was okay, but didn't feel like going out with me. I was mad at her and I told her off for it. I didn't want to ruin the evening because I came out for a purpose and I was going to stick to the plan. The park is fairly well lit and pretty safe. I could see some other people walking around at that time, so I wasn't that worried. I sat off down the long pathway, listening to music and enjoying the cool air. I pondered 
Starting a permanent habit of going out at this time by myself, I kept going, and I was sweaty and gradually, people started to become fewer and fewer. Even when listening to my music, I heard what sounded like a scream. I stopped, took my earbuds out, and I listened for any more sounds. I was right under a light, and I tried to look if I could see anyone. Then I heard the distinct sound of a baby crying, and I waited to see if the baby would quiet down. But why was a baby out at this time at night? Did something happen to the mother? I was too scared to call out. I slowly walked toward the sound, and the baby's cries got louder and louder. I saw a baby carrier, the kind you place in a car near a blanket and close to some trees. It looked damn suspicious, so I froze, unsure whether I should check the baby or call the police first. If the baby died before I went over to look, I never would have forgiven myself, so I jogged over and I didn't see anyone. I pulled the car seat back and it was covered in a blanket and ripped it away. There was a doll in the car seat with a small speaker taped around its neck. I let out a scream and I backed away, nearly falling over in the process. I didn't see anyone hiding or anything. I didn't wait to find out if there was anyone there. I turned and I ran as fast as I could out of the park and into a well-lit area. I could hear some people running behind me and I could have sworn that I heard someone tell me to wait or to stop. Well, there was no way in hell that I would be stopping for anyone. It was only when I was at a nearby restaurant that I slowed down and I told them what happened to me in the park. I don't know if they were human traffickers or just people who wanted to rob me. Either way, someone who does something like this doesn't have good intentions. I should have called the police instead. I did. I called the police afterward and I reported it. These sorts of crimes happen in the rougher areas of town rather than where I lived. They were mainly robberies. I only go jogging with people now or during daylight to prevent these things from happening. The sad thing is, people stop walking through the park as much, including me. It is sad that the actions of a few can impact the many. I used to feel so safe here. Back whenever I was in college, I had a phase where I was very heavily into gaming. I was kind of your stereotypical MMORPG nerd. And if I wasn't in class or studying, I was online and playing with my crew. I'm not gonna lie, I made more friends playing that dumb game than I ever did trying to socialize with my classmates. The people online were more accepting and were more willing to accept me into their circle even though I was a bit different. It's not fully relevant to the story, but I've always had an issue with self-identity, and obviously those years were a time for development. So it was a bit rough as I was trying to find myself. Thankfully I had my crew, and I will always be grateful for most of them. Note the word most. There was one guy who for the sake of the story, we're going to call Gaines. That was part of his username, and that's what we all referred to him as when we were in the crew, so it's a valid way to identify him. Gaines seemed like an okay dude, from what I knew at first. He was funny, he always had a quip ready or a joke to throw out there, and he knew pretty much everything about the game. He and I became pretty decent friends, often teaming up when no one else was online, and just chatting about random stuff. He was also in college, so we did have some common ground, and I think that that helped quite a bit. It was a fun time, but after a little while, Gaines started getting a bit… weird. He started messaging me out of our gaming sessions which was kind of this unspoken rule amongst the crew. 
for whatever reason, we all had this understanding that we only talked to each other in-game, or about the game, and we never tried to get personal with each other beyond just being friends. It was probably an anxiety thing all around, to be honest, but it was what it was. At first, his messages were just friendly banter. He would send me an email about how much he hated the class he was in, how his professor was an a-hole or whatever, nothing too far out there. I would respond with something short like, Oh, damn man, that sucks. I know how that feels. Just basic responses like that. Then, after a couple days of him messaging me on the side, he pushed further and started asking personal questions. Like where I lived, questions about my family, if I was dating anybody, if I had any younger siblings, which, while unrelated, probably should have been a red flag, and random things about my daily routine. I figured that he was just curious, and probably just as awkward as I was, so maybe he didn't know how to start a proper conversation. I didn't really answer most of the questions that he asked. I mentioned that I wasn't super comfortable telling him about my personal life, and he seemed to agree and understand, saying that he didn't mean to make me feel uncomfortable. Then, out of nowhere, I got another message from him that turned up the creep factor. He mentioned that he found out the two of us, apparently, lived in the same state, and he said that we were practically neighbors. I never told him where I lived. I never mentioned what region of the country I lived in, so this revelation was a bit… jarring. He started to insist that we meet up, saying, Since we get along so well, it'd be stupid for us to not hang out IRL. I mentioned that I would think about it, but that I was super busy with college and I didn't have much time for a social life. To which he responded, But you have time for the game? I hated that he had a point with that, because he knew when I was in the game, and he knew that it was pretty frequent, mostly because he was also always in the game with all of us. I mentioned that the game was my way of relaxing, and that I wasn't a very social person, and Gaines said, let's just meet up once, and we can see how we like it. I genuinely did not want to meet up with him but he kept pushing it and pushing it, and I didn't want to pick a fight with someone that was friends with everyone else that I considered a friend. So, I agreed to meet up at a small restaurant on the edge of town, something public and where a lot of people would be just in case. The next day, I got an email from someone else from the crew that asked if Gaines and I were dating. It was a bit weird, but I mentioned no, that I wasn't interested in him, as he wasn't my target demographic, if you get my drift, and then asked why. He then forwarded an email that he had apparently sent to everyone in the crew, except for me, that said he and I were meeting up for the first time after having been in love in an online relationship for months. I was so confused. I told him that we'd been talking for a couple of weeks through email, that he had contacted me, and that he had been pushy about meeting up, and that it was nothing like that. He then told me that I needed to make sure that Gaines knew that, because he apparently had a very different idea of what we were. I was pretty fed up with it at this point. He had made me feel so awkward, and he was so pushy about meeting up, and I had given in because I thought it would be harmless, and I didn't want to make it awkward with our crew. And then he went and made it awkward in his own way. I went ahead and started a message to everyone else, including Gaines, and I made sure to put in the message that he and I were not together, that he was mistaken about our meeting up, and that it was going to be nothing more than as friends. I reiterated what everyone in the group should have known, that I was swinging for the other team, 
and that I was not interested in him at all like that. Apparently this was the wrong thing to do, and he did not take it very well. About ten minutes after I sent the email, I got a phone call from a blocked number on my cell phone. At first, I ignored it, and then I got another one, so I went ahead and answered it. As soon as I did, the person on the other end, who I learned was Gaines, started screaming at me about how I had ruined his life. Worse yet, as he finished his rant, he ended it by saying, If I ever see you, Elizabeth Mary, you are dead. So he threatened my life and used my first and middle names, which told me he knew who I was, which was terrifying. I had never given him any information about me like that. He knew me by my username. My email wasn't even registered with my real name. It was my character's pseudonym. And then there's the fact that he was able to get my phone number to call me. I have no idea how this person knew so much about me, but he knew where I lived, my name, my number, but it was pretty clear that this was a dangerous individual. I did file a report with the police, since he was threatening me, but I didn't have much information beyond his email and username and that he lived kind of close to the area. The person I was talking to wasn't exactly a tech person, so it was a struggle to explain that I knew him from a video game, but the report was made. And, well, that was it. There was some more banter in the group email about the whole thing, and I mentioned to one of the friends that had reached out to me that Gaines had somehow found all of my personal information. He was nice about it, gave me some tips on things to check and lock down on my social medias, none of which was connected to my game account or email, and I went through what he said. But honestly, there was nothing indicative of how he found me. After a while, I just kind of stopped playing the game. I was nervous that I would run into Gaines, or that the crew would treat me differently, because of all of this. So I stopped playing as much, and eventually I just quit altogether. I do keep in touch with two of the people that were in the group, and it's been a few years, and from what they've told me, after Gaines pulled this, the group sort of dissipated. I also found out that I wasn't the only person in the crew that he had started messaging, and he managed to find all of her personal information as well, and that he apparently threatened her when she rejected him. In the end, I am grateful that nothing really happened, that he and I never ran into each other, and that he just left me alone after all of this. But it was still pretty damn creepy. He had way too much information on me, and I don't know how he found it but he did. I feel like he could have done much worse, so I guess I'm thankful that he had some restraint in the matter. And nowadays, I only play single-player games or games without comms. I don't want anything like this to ever happen to me again. I'm sorry for the long explanation. I really want to make the details clear for you to understand the situation better. Also, please don't mind my grammar mistakes. English is my third language. I'm a girl living in Northern Europe. I won't go into too much detail where this happened because I don't want people to recognize me from this story. This story takes place in October when I had a part-time job in this certain research center. This wasn't a bigger city, not like in the middle of it, but it was a 30-minute bus ride from where I lived at that time. Keep in mind that the workplace was in an industrial estate, so the only people that really spent time in the area were the workers from these companies. I work all three shifts, morning, evenings, and nights, but I did mostly night shifts because none of my co-workers really wanted them. And I'm a night owl anyway, 
so the 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. shift worked well for me. This happened on one of these night shifts. It was a Thursday night, and I was one of the three workers there that night. We didn't work together. We were all in our own departments, doing different kind of work, also far from each other in the building. I work at a chem lab, doing water analysis, so it was not any kind of customer service job. We were basically all alone, and it got usually really quiet and rather peaceful. We had no security guards, but it was quite impossible to enter the building without an identification card. All the doors were locked, and everyone that worked there had these cards where you hold it in the sensor on the door, and then it opens. You also got to use the card when leaving the building. These locked doors were not only on the outside, but also inside the building, so if someone somehow managed to get through the first door, without the card, they could not get any further in the building, to the labs for example. The door locks again immediately after you get in or out. So considering that, we never really had to worry about someone uninvited getting in even in the nighttime. This particular night, I took a bus and I headed to work. I greeted my co-workers that were leaving as their shifts had just ended, and I met the other night shifters in the women's dressing room. It was all normal. I was in a good mood, and so were my two co-workers. When our shift started, we parted our ways and went to different labs. I was three hours into my shift at 1 a.m. when I decided to take my 20-minute break. The two co-workers had went to their break earlier than me, so I had to go alone this time. Our break room was this lounge where there were a couple of long tables, chairs, mini kitchen, and a bathroom. I'm not gonna lie, this big hall with old flickering ceiling lights was not my favorite place to be alone at at 1am when the whole building is almost empty and it's pitch black outside. There were big windows in the lounge, but I could not see anything out of them, just darkness. There was always the same eerie vibe at night, so I was used to it. Five minutes into my break, I decided to go outside to smoke a cigarette. I put a jacket on, took my shit with me, and I opened the door with a card. We had this smoking place in the back of the parking lot, about one minute walk away from the door. If I said I wasn't scared to be alone in an empty parking lot at night, as a young girl, I would be lying. This was the only thing that I really did not like about the night shifts. But I really needed that cigarette. Besides, nothing bad had ever happened, and I live in a generally safe country, so I just hope for the best. There was this nasty white plastic chair in the smoking place, so I sat in it and I lit my cigarette. From the smoking place, I could see clearly to the entrance of the building that there were bright lights above the door. Usually, I just stared at that door without even noticing it. I mean, it was at night in an industrial estate area and there were not many interesting things to look at at all. But all of a sudden, I noticed a person walking up to the door. It was a man with a trench coat and a top hat holding a briefcase. I had never seen this man before in my work or anywhere near this place. This man stood still in front of the door, not moving at all facing the door. Even though nothing seemingly bad had happened yet, just a weird man standing by the door I can't even explain in words how scared I was. I had to somehow get past that man to get back inside. And he doesn't know I'm there. He didn't see me. What if he does something to me while I'm trying to get inside? Is he trying to get inside? What does he want? And who is he? This was the only door where I could enter the building from outside, so I don't really have a choice. I just try 
and ignore that man on the door and then get inside. What on earth is this weirdly dressed man doing in this area at 1 a.m.? There is clearly something he wants from us, and I wasn't even sure if I wanted to know what that was. I started walking towards the man in the door while he was still standing not knowing that I'm here in the parking lot. The closer I got, the more scared I got. I had to stop and think again. I knew it was part of my job to confront unwanted people, trying to get in, and tell them how to contact our customer service. But keep in mind, this was 1 a.m. A weird man who appeared out of thin air and an 18-year-old girl alone. I had this gut feeling that I should not go to that door. So I decided to call my co-worker that was there that night and ask if she could meet me at the door and then let me in so I didn't need to face this man alone. I went and hid behind my co-worker's car that was in the parking lot to make a call. I was hiding behind the car in this position where I could still see this man through the car windows. I wanted to see if he leaves and where he goes. My co-worker answers the call and when I start whispering in the phone and explaining the situation, I watch in horror as the man turns around and stares right at the car that I was hiding behind. I don't think he saw me, but he for sure heard there was a woman talking behind this car. And what happened next is straight from a horror movie. When this man found out that there was someone behind the car, he started slowly and quietly approaching me, not knowing that I could see him through the window. And here's the thing. He did not walk. He did not run. He was on all fours, crawling, towards the goddamn car. I couldn't even scream. I just froze from fear, and the phone dropped from my hand. When this man was getting closer to the car, I see both of my co-workers opening the door, waving and screaming at me to run and then come in. They did not need to tell me twice. I ran inside so fast that the man didn't even have time to react, and when he got up and started running after me, the door was already closed. The second he heard the door lock itself, he turned around and started speed walking away, eventually disappearing into the darkness. We called the cops immediately, and they came not long after. They did not find anything or anyone. That man disappeared fast as he had appeared, and no one has seen him since. After the shift, my co-workers walked me to the bus stop and waited with me till the bus arrived, making sure that I get home safely. I am forever thankful to these lovely women for opening the door for me before that man got me, and God knows what he would have done to me. I haven't done any night shifts after that, and for sure, never will. This happened to me about a week ago. I found a summer job at our local supermarket, and about two weeks in, I got asked to work the late night shift which was around 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. I accepted since I was in need of money and I never sleep early. Everything was fine and dandy until about 3 a.m. when a shirtless, scarred-up guy came into the store. After lingering around the store for a while, he quickly came up to the counter, making intense eye contact with me. As I was about to ask him if he needed any help, he whispered, Don't you dare move. I didn't hear him at first, so I asked him if he could repeat that. At that point, he got agitated and then he yelled, Make another sound and I will cut you up. And in a swift motion, he vaulted over the counter going to the alcohol section trying to grab a bottle of whiskey. Thankfully, the owner has hit a baseball bat under the counter. The moment that he turned his back to me, 
I took the bat and I swung full force at his knee. He winced in pain, and he tried to get up. I winded my bat again, acting like I was going to hit him again, just to see him pull out a homemade shiv of some sort. I let him get up, and the moment he got up, he swung his shiv at me, lightly lacerating my wrist. I pushed him back with my bat, and he ran for the door and got out. The day after, I called the cops and I showed them the security camera footage. But they haven't contacted me since. I think it's safe to say that I won't be working the late night shift again for a long, long time. So, scarred shirtless guy, let's not meet again. I work at a convenience store, and I've had some creepy customers come in before, but this one was a little more disturbing. If it weren't for what had been said and done, I don't think this would have been that bad. I normally work third shift, which is 4pm to around 12am, and I'm by myself for the last four hours of my shift. This man had come in earlier that day, and he was acting odd, jittery, chewing at his lip constantly, fumbling with his debit card to the point that I did everything for him except putting the pin in. Well, fast forward to around 10.30pm, I'm sweeping the floors as I'm supposed to every night, when the man entered again. He approached my register, and I asked him what he needed, and he said, Um, hey... Can I have one of those lighters? I pick one up and I go to scan it, but he then tells me that he doesn't have any money. I tell him that he can't have it, and then he glares at me before leaving. A man was in line behind him, and the entire time that I was scanning his things, the lighter guy was staring at me through the window right next to my register. He eventually walks off, and the man jokes about the creepy guy asking for the lighter when he, the man in line, didn't even have his with him. He tells me to be safe, he then walks out to the gas pumps, and I start sweeping again. But when I turn around to move a small crate out of my way, the creepy guy is staring at me again, just watching me work. Well... I quickly make my way to the back room to make mop water so I could get away from him for a second. He stayed there for a solid five minutes before stalking off again. I grab a random receipt as a cover and I basically bolted to the man at the gas pumps. I got close and I asked if he was in a hurry to go anywhere. I told him that the creepy lighter guy was still hanging around and that it was really freaking me out. He promises me that he didn't plan on actually leaving after getting gas. At this point, I thought that it wouldn't take up too much of his time, since we both thought that the man was already wandering away from the store. Unfortunately, he went back toward the store a few seconds later. Soon, an older woman comes in, and I warn her about the creepy guy. She asked what I was talking about, and I subtly nod into his direction. Mind you, he's still hanging around my window. She looks a little disturbed, leaning in and whispering. She asked, What does he want? I explained that he wanted a lighter, but he didn't have money so I didn't give him one. I told her to be careful, and she quickly told me to worry more about myself since I was at the store alone. She left and I saw the creepy guy approach the window again. Thankfully, he didn't look in, just hung around like he was waiting for someone. After a while, a daughter of a family friend comes in with her girlfriend, and we quietly make small talk, and like the last woman... I warned them that the lighter guy was still roaming around 
and that he could be dangerous. And before they get to tell me anything, a woman who was talking with a guy from the gas pumps hurried in and then told me to call the cops. Obviously, not familiar with the area that I was working in and hearing three different people telling me what numbers to call, I was shaking in near tears. My family friend said that she would call while I calmed down and another girl had run out at this point. I don't really blame her. Family friend's girlfriend told me that the lighter guy threatened to throw rocks through the window and to hurt and rob me. After about three minutes of pacing and trying not to cry, I saw my mom's truck pull in. I bolted to her, telling her what was going on, and she calmed me down and walked me back to the entrance. As this happened, the creepy guy had climbed the hill and crossed the street to bridge angles and sat near the front door. The cops arrived, and the man from the pumps gave his statement and I gave mine, and finally, my family friend gave hers. From what was said, he was about to break into my car. The man that stayed with me stopped him, but that didn't stop the creep from roaming. After we talked to the cops, they sped to Bujangles and confronted the lighter guy. After arguing and a quick pat-down and more arguing, the man was put in the back of the cop car. A lighter guy, I know you were probably on something, but please... Let's not meet ever again. I work a graveyard shift as a security guard for a recycling yard. I can't say the company for obvious reasons, but I've been on this side for two weeks, this being the second. Basically, every hour... I make rounds across a giant recycling yard covered in various precious metals that are broken down and sold. During my shift, I scan various checkpoints and ensure that nobody besides me is in the yard or in the facility. One of my other tasks is to go through some grassy or bushy terrain and over a set of train tracks to take a photo of a warehouse far across. This is to ensure that it is safe and clear. I have to use a flashlight with 2K lumens so I can see my way through pretty much the entire yard. Well, just an hour and a half ago on my round, I went through the grass and over the train tracks. I took the picture of the warehouse and then I submitted it. But all of a sudden, I get this intense feeling that I'm being watched. My hairs on my neck stand up and I freeze. My flashlight is still on and pointing at the warehouse. I slowly turn around and I point my flashlight behind me. I kid you not, about 10 yards away, I see a skinny, old wrinkled white man with a large white beard sitting on a chair. He was looking directly at me. He had dirty jean overalls and what I think was a western-style cowboy fedora on. He was bare skin under the overalls. Now, I'm six foot and 220 pounds, but I screamed at a pitch that was embarrassing. Accidentally, I dropped my flashlight out of shock. Mind you, there are thin, tiny metal shards literally everywhere on the ground, and I can't see a damn thing now as the flashlight is facing away from my sight. And all I hear is quick pace or shuffling or clanging of metal from footsteps quickly running towards me. And once the metal crunching footsteps are within maybe five feet of me, I hear them quickly veer to the left and past me. Within three to four seconds, the metal clanging is gone, followed by the faraway sound of rustling bushes. I then grabbed my flashlight from the ground and I pointed to the sound. The old man was gone, past the bushes to who knows where. I was shaking from adrenaline and fear. I managed to catch my breath and I called several emergency contacts. 
and when they arrived, the old man was long gone. I believe maybe he was just there to watch the active trains move across. I say this because the metal chair was facing the tracks, and it's still there. I took a photo of it, more as a memento if anything. I am now in the office and still terrified and alone. I have to finish my shift tonight, and tomorrow I have to do another 11-hour graveyard. I won't quit as I need the money, and I just wanted to get this off my chest. This was maybe eight or nine years back. I was an office worker at the time. It was not uncommon that we would have to stay back to work late at times to catch up on paperwork, especially as the financial year came to an end. It was one of such nights. It wasn't quite the deadline, but I was going on vacation soon and had to get all my work in order. I won't go into details as that is not what this story is about and the boredom would stop you from listening. As fate would have it, I was the last one left, hunched over my desk in my cubicle, trying to get all my work done. As a rule to save money, if there was only one or two people in the office, then only the personal desk lights and the bare minimum of lighting would be used. So my desk was an island in a sea of blackness. I wasn't quite the only one in the building though. There was a security guard at his desk on level 1, who would do rounds from time to time, and also a small cleaning crew, who would be through around 2 to 3 a.m. I was hoping to be out by then, but maybe I wouldn't. So I was at my desk, hating my life, dreaming of the vacation I was going on, and really seriously thinking if I wanted to come back to this. My mind was wandering too easily and not focusing on the task at hand, so I decided to go to the break room to get a much-needed coffee. I stood up and slowly made my way to the hallway that led to my goal. The hallways also had minimal lighting, kinda dehumanizing, working so hard to make the company money and they won't even light the hallway properly for my hard-working ass. I get to the break room and switch on the light. I fill the coffee maker and switch it on. The way I was going, I figured I was going to be there a while. Luckily, the next day was a Saturday, so I wouldn't be working. As I was waiting for the coffee to make, I started getting an uneasy feeling. Like a prickling at the back of my head and tunnel vision. I felt like I should just take off running. Like a flight response, but I had no idea why. It was just the same break room that I frequented every day. I just guessed I was overtired and unused to working back so late alone. There was usually at least one or two others, but being all alone was a first for me. The coffee maker was doing that gurgling thing it does when it's almost finished. But at the same time, I'm sure I could hear a similar gurgling out in the hallway. Or was it in another room and I'm hearing it through the wall? or back where the desks and cubicles are. I figured the silence and aloneness was playing with my head, and my imagination was running wild. Although, no amount of rationalizing could shake the uneasiness I felt. I just focused on the task at hand and made my coffee. As I opened the fridge to fetch the milk, I had the most overwhelming feeling that someone was right behind me. I stopped what I was doing and spun around. I was alone. But as I turned back to the fridge, something in the hallway caught my eye. I could have sworn I saw a head peeking in from the side of the doorway at me. It was like a normal guy, but someone had adjusted the contrast way too much, if that makes sense. Like the features were extremely shadowed, and the eyes were more like dark pits. But it was only for a split second. I felt a weird mix of feelings at that moment. I was extremely creeped out, but at the same time relieved that I wasn't alone. And most of all, mad. That whoever was with me was trying to spook me so much. Anger won out over the other emotions, and I ran out to the hallway on reflex. 
there was no one there. Feeling a little embarrassed that, as a grown man, I was letting being alone at night in my office freak me out so much. I quickly finished making my coffee and forced myself to return to my cubicle at a regular pace rather than hurried. I was just freaking myself out. If I rush, it will only make me panic even more. I sat back at my cubicle, sipped my coffee, and got back to work. The coffee was gradually making me feel a bit better, as was focusing on my work. But I just couldn't shake the feeling someone was behind me, watching me, getting closer each time I stopped to think about it. I just hunkered down and got into my work. As time went on, I kept feeling some kind of breeze or wind brush against my neck, legs, arm. It was faint, so maybe just paranoia? I looked at my clock, 12.30am. I was staying back later than I wanted. Then, the whispering started. Faint at first, but every so often, it would go past my ear with that breeze thing I experienced before. I kept trying to tell myself, I was just tired, needed rest, was imagining things, just gotta finish my work, just 30 minutes more. Then, my lamp, the only light on the floor, started flickering. It must just be the globe, I told myself. Only 30 minutes, 50 minutes tops. I just kept trying to convince myself so I could finish and go home. Just when I thought it couldn't get any worse, things intensified to a level I couldn't rationalize away. The cubicle, two to my left, started to shake. Like the start of an earthquake, if you've ever experienced that. Then it stopped, briefly, only to resume in the cubicle, right next to mine. I started packing my stuff up in a panic. Then it stopped. I waited in shock, planning my next move. It didn't resume. I started trying to decide what to do. It had stopped for about five minutes. Was it over? Just when I started to relax, my whole cubicle and desk started to shake violently. That was it. I was out. I grabbed whatever was close at hand. Luckily my keys and wallet were my jacket, which I made sure to grab. Unfortunately, in my panic, I only grabbed a third of what I needed to complete my work. But I didn't care. I was done. I rushed out so fast. When I passed the security guard in my mad dash out, he called after me, questioning me. But I couldn't understand. I was in such a panic. Call me a coward, but this was just too much. I changed jobs after my vacation. There was no way I could continue to work somewhere where I experienced such a terrifying event. Hey there, I've been a long time listener and I had a story that I wanted to share with you that unfortunately happened to me. I used to work at a liquor store for a little over a year. I actually quit after this event occurred. I am a single first time mother and my baby is almost 10 months old. So needless to say, she pretty much never leaves my sight. Sometimes, my mom would visit and help me take care of her or watch her while I sleep at my place, but it's not very often as she lives about an hour away. That's more so when she just comes to visit on the weekends. I'm in my 30s and I had been with the same guy for the last 7 or 8 years until we learned that I was pregnant. Then, he claimed that he never loved me and that he was just here for the ride, etc., etc. So, he moved out of the apartment that we shared, leaving me to pay the rent alone, which I couldn't afford. And after a nightmare of a move and more debt to deal with, I moved out too, and at least I found a place that I could afford on my income. Before all of this chaos, I had a steady job at a staffing firm, and they laid a lot of people off, which left me desperate to find anything that would pay me. 
That's how I ended up working at a liquor store. But to my surprise, they treated us better there than I expected. They even had benefit options and were flexible and willing to work with all of us when it came to our schedules. This was a huge relief for me because I didn't have someone that lived close by to watch my daughter, nor could I afford to pay for a babysitter or daycare. So, I told the owners, which was an older couple, about having a child, and the wife, Darla, was absolutely smitten when she saw her the first time and told me that I was welcome to bring her with me, since it's not like she was going to be running down the aisles and potentially breaking things. This was such a huge stress lifted for me, knowing that I could work and still keep my eye on my daughter. I usually stayed behind the counter, at the register, and she stayed in her car seat. Darla actually brought in a small bassinet that she had bought specifically for me, and then she kept it in the back room. When I worked, I would then bring it out and set it up, which gave her a bit more wiggle room. They really did treat me like family. The pay was decent too. I knew I would eventually need to find a job where I made more, but for the moment, I was feeling happy again and I felt like I belonged, so I was definitely getting comfortable with a job. Anyways, I'm sorry for rambling. Back to the story. I didn't really have a set shift, and I would work days or nights wherever they needed me. This happened when I was working the closing shift, which was from about 5 to 11 p.m., typically till midnight. After all, typically till midnight, after all the after closing work was done, it usually wasn't too busy, being a smaller store so it wasn't unusual to be alone on the night shift, which I was okay with too. We had a few of our regulars come in as normal, but then after about 9 or 10 p.m. on a Tuesday night, it was pretty dead. I would turn on the TV that was behind the register, and I would just watch something or play a game on my phone. The owners were okay with this, as long as when a customer comes in, we are paying attention to them. Maybe not watching them like a hawk or something, but checking the above mirrors to make sure that they are not stealing anything and making sure that you are giving them your attention, which made sense to me. And so on this night, I had my daughter in the bassinet and she was sleeping. I was playing Sodoku on my phone when the doorbell chimed and a guy walked in. I greeted him, and all he did was look at me, and then quickly look away. I immediately took a mental note of what he looked like. Whether they are rude or suspicious, those people tend to stand out. Unfortunately, he was hitting both labels. He was wearing jeans and a gray hoodie with a hood pulled up. It had been raining, and I could see that the hood was a little wet, so at first, I assume that's why it was up. He had a bit of a beard growing that stuck out from the hoodie, but not much. And after opening the door, his hands remained in his front pocket while he walked around. This is when I started feeling a little uneasy about this guy. I would glance up at the mirrors, and I would see him constantly looking up at it too, and would quickly look back down when our eyes would meet. I started watching his movement closer and noticed that he was looking around the store, not like he was trying to find something, but more so casing the place. This started to worry me. We weren't in a bad or shady part of the city, and in fact, this store was part of a strip of stores, which actually had a small open bar at the end. So, even though I was alone in the store... I was definitely not alone in the middle of nowhere. While doing my best not to let him notice my nervousness, I slowly dialed 911 on my phone and let it sit there, 
without hitting the call button yet, and I slid it back under the counter. After he walked up and down every aisle, he came back towards the front while also looking down the back where the office was. He then approached the register, empty-handed, mind you, and he turned his attention to the smaller hooter bottles that we kept up front on the counter. He grabbed a few and laid them in front of me. I then asked him if he found everything that he was looking for. And while looking down, he said, Uh, kind of. He then looked up, making direct eye contact and said, Are you here alone? I, at least, wasn't stupid enough to tell him the truth. So, trying to sound as intimidating as possible, I told him no and that the boss was in the back and asked if he wanted me to get them. He gave me a sinister smirk, declining my offer, and tossed a few bills at me. After giving him his change, he grabbed the bottles and then put them in his pocket. Which is when I noticed that there was already something in his pocket. Something long. I wanted to scream right there, but to my surprise, he just left. I watched as he walked around the corner and when he was out of view, I quickly went to lock the door. At this point, I was pretty freaked out, reasonably so, so I called Darla to tell her what I just witnessed and let her know that I wasn't feeling comfortable being alone. Thankfully, she agreed and understood and said that she would have her husband James come down here. She also told me to keep the door locked and just let the customers in as they appear. This is what I meant by that they were very considerate instead of just telling me to buck up. As far as I was aware, they had never been robbed before, so it was a pretty scary situation all around. Made worse in my opinion, because I had my little girl with me. So, I waited anxiously for James to arrive and just paced the front, watching my daughter as she seemed to be the only thing to calm me down. Unfortunately, this would come to an abrupt halt when I heard someone trying to open the door. When I looked over at the door, my heart dropped, seeing the same exact guy. Except this time, I must have ruined his plans when he noticed that the door was locked. I saw his face immediately turn to one of anger and aggression and we then made eye contact. I froze, not knowing what to do, as my phone was on the counter, which was closer to the door. The door and the two walls were just glass, so what was stopping him from trying to break it? Or worse yet, how well would the glass hold with his banging and yanking on the door? Because that's exactly what he started doing. He began yanking on the door harder and pounding on the glass, while yelling at me to let him in. I just kept telling him no and yelling at him to leave because he wouldn't let up. My daughter is now awake and crying, and this guy is yelling. I then notice that his right hand, which he was using to bang on the door, was holding something. And when he would lower his arm to yell at me, I could finally tell that it was a knife. I was in full panic mode at this point. I went to grab my daughter, ready to run to the back, when the glass finally broke. Thank God, they had an alarm system that went off when there was glass breaking. So with my daughter in my arms, I ran to the back and locked myself in the bathroom, hoping that he wouldn't try to go back there. Unfortunately, as I sat there, I realized that I didn't have my phone on me, so all I could do was wait until someone came to help. It felt like an eternity, trying to calm my daughter while also trying to keep calm. When I started hearing someone call out for me, they identified themselves as an officer and said that I was safe now, so I opened the door. I saw two men standing by the door in uniform, and they asked me if I was okay 
and then led me outside where James and Darla and a few random people were. They hugged me and asked if I was okay and also apologized that I had to go through that. We then all talked to the cops about what I saw and thankfully, they at least had security cameras that recorded and saved every 24 hours so we were able to provide that to the authorities. The guy also didn't get very far as some people that were leaving the nearby bar could hear this guy yelling and banging and one of them in their drunken bravery chased him down. I had to identify him and man, I never thought that IDing someone would be as unnerving, especially when they gave me that same smirk when pointing them out. Needless to say, I was pretty shaken up by this and I told James and Darla that I didn't think I could do it anymore. They were disappointed to see me go, but also understood. I've been out of work for a little over a month now and I'm incredibly thankful that my mom has been able to help me with rent and groceries this past month. Darla actually called me last week and said that they were putting in reinforced glass and a much better door because of this, which was really good to hear. But she also asked if I'd be willing to come back if I was only on days. I'm still mulling it over as... It was a decent paying job, but that night just keeps replaying back in my head. Anyways, thank you for listening. This happened about a year and a half ago. I was at work on a night shift and it was a little past midnight. I ordered DoorDash for myself and my supervisor since it was her birthday. I was happy to see that I had the same driver as last time, as I work in a small building, among other identical buildings, with a convoluted road system in between all of them. It can be a little confusing for someone that's not used to it. I had been watching the map and I went outside once he was close by. I stood under a cluster of bright lights in our parking lot. I was wearing neon yellow, so you couldn't miss me. Immediately, I get a call from my driver asking me to come to him. I look around and I don't see anyone until I walk a couple of yards to the center of the lot. He was sitting on the side of my building by the dumpster where there was no light at all. He also had his lights off, and I'm thinking, what the hell, dude? I start waving my arms and telling him that I'm in front of the building and he's on the side. He hangs up and just chills there for a minute. At this point, I'm really annoyed because our food is getting cold and this guy delivered to me in the exact same spot a week before. Finally, he turns his lights on, comes over to me. As soon as he pulls up, he's speaking another language into his phone, which then translates to English, something like, Hello, I'm practicing English and I need new friends. Will you be my friend? And then he puts the phone towards me. I feel like I'm speaking to a child because, Hello, this is inappropriate, and I just say, Oh, uh, that's a cool app. And I look at him, waiting. He keeps speaking into the app about needing friends, and I tell him that my supervisor is waiting for me, and I reach out my hand for the food. He tries to touch my hand, and then asks for my number. At this point, the fact that he had tried to get me in the dark Plus his persistence turned my growing annoyance into fear. I tell him that I need the food and he asked me to get in his car in perfect English. Thank the Lord, because at this moment, someone in my sister building comes out and makes their way over to the lot. He finally gives me my food and then he scurries off which freaked me out. 
Why, after all that, would he speed off at the sight of another person? Clearly, his intentions were not good. I reported all of this to DoorDash at that time, as well as my local police and on social media. And it turns out that he had done this to someone who lives two miles away from me. She had also ordered late at night, and he apparently asked her if she lived alone and if they could hang out while holding her food hostage. DoorDash assured me that they had deactivated him, but his boldness, plus the fact that he seems to only drive late at night, makes me think that he does this a lot and has probably already assaulted someone. I used to work nights at 7-Eleven in countryside Saitama, Japan. I won't say exactly where, but Saitama is pretty much the same all over, just with more or less people. Being in the countryside, mine had less people, mainly nuisance biker kids stopping for cigarettes or people just heading home. But there was one customer whose memory will haunt me forever. As I said, my 7-Eleven was in the countryside, so it was basically the brightest thing as far as the eye could see at night. It was a quiet weekday night, I think Wednesday or Thursday. Working nights, I always found those two days tended to blur together the most. No one had come in for over an hour. I'd done all of my nighttime duties for basically the whole night. I was working alone, as I often did since the volume of traffic at night in this location could never justify paying another person. I was lazily wiping the counter for the third or fourth time that night, just listening to the cicadas and crickets outside. I was so focused on my work that I didn't even notice the figure at the window staring in. I jumped in surprise upon seeing him and did a polite nod. It was a wrinkly old man with kind of dead looking eyes. Unusually, he did not return my greeting gesture. He just kept staring in at me. It was like 3am. What was this old man who was pushing at least 75 years old, and I'm being generous here, doing out so late? It's not unheard of, I supposed, but he wasn't actually doing anything apart from staring at me. I was starting to get really creeped out. Outside the store was dark and quiet and I hadn't seen any customers in over an hour. Actually, I hadn't even seen any cars pass the store in that long either. Then, another thought occurred to me. There were no cars in the car park. There weren't really any houses nearby either. Was this a ghost? I didn't really believe in ghosts, but... I couldn't really think of anything else. But he was solid looking. The longer he stared at me, the more I felt creeped out. Actually, more than that, I was starting to panic. I came to a decision, and I'm not really proud of it. I figured if he wasn't in the store, he wasn't a customer. Therefore, wasn't my responsibility. So I pulled the blind down, on the window he was staring from. My hand was shaking as I did so. I was mere centimeters away from his face. He held my gaze the whole time. He looked directly into my eyes, and I couldn't look away. The old guy didn't move, even a little. Being so close to him, I felt all the hairs on the back of my neck stand up on end, and my stomach was tying itself in knots. I did see his chest move up and down, however, so he wasn't a ghost. After I had closed the blind, I went back to the counter and stood there, uneasily. I really didn't know what to do. It felt so strange just leaving him out there, but my mind was racing and I just couldn't think clearly. What was I meant to do? I even briefly considered turning the lights off, but then I snapped out of it and realized how ridiculous I was being. The creepiness of the situation had put my mind in a panic and I wasn't thinking straight. 
I then realized that I must go and see if he needed help. I mustered the courage, went to the front window, and raised the blinds once more. He was still there, but his eyes were somewhat bigger now. We were locked in a staring contest that I couldn't look away from. This went on for what seemed like forever. His eyes seemed to keep getting bigger too. Then, something happened to break the standoff. The old man slowly brought his head to the glass. Softly at first, but as time went on, harder and harder. Now I had to do something. I ran out and tried to stop the man. He was stronger than I expected and he continued to hit the window with his head again and again. So I tried harder to stop him but I didn't want to hurt him. I managed to stop him for a, a brief moment and then he did the unimaginable. He started to yell. Just a continuous, unintelligible sound. The longer I held on, the louder he got until it reached a scream. This was a battle I was not going to win. I ran inside and called the police with him still bellowing outside. I tried to explain as best I could but was extremely shaken up. Luckily, the operator could hear the screaming on the other end. The police came 15 minutes later and seemed to be familiar with the man. They calmed him down and loaded him into their patrol car. They took him away without really explaining anything to me. About half an hour later they came back and explained to me that the old man lived in a care facility about 10 minutes away by car, which meant that it was about 30 to 40 minutes on foot for the old man. Before his mental deterioration, he actually used to live in a house where the convenience store now stood. It was sold to pay for his care as his only living family, a son, lived and worked in Tokyo and was too busy to care for him. He actually escapes from time to time to go home and just can't understand where his house is. I left the job not long after this. I knew if it happened again I could just call the police but whenever I worked nights after this, I kept imagining I could see the old man. I was always on edge and very jumpy and even started losing sleep over it. This was about 8 to 10 years back, so I'm guessing the old man has since passed on. I wonder if his spirit is still trying to go home. Back in my early 20s, I used to work for a large tech company that made and repaired a lot of large expensive equipment. Most of it was medical related, but there were a few other cleaning and sanitizing things that they did as well. And now, with that type of equipment came a lot of pretty important partners and stacks upon stack of confidential information. Of course, you can't really hide those kinds of machines easily, so that meant that the building that I worked in was huge. Not to mention, the entrances in every room or office had restricted access. Everyone had a badge, or your badge would only let you into the rooms and areas that you are permitted to be in. When I started, I got lost once, and I learned my lesson. People gave you weird looks if they didn't recognize you, so I caught on pretty quickly. I was hired to do data entry, but pretty quickly, they had me doing other tasks, including filing, and even found myself helping with a lot of tech support questions. I'd say that a majority of the people that work there were a bit on the older side, so there was always an issue with someone's system and they could never quite understand how to access the task manager. But I did genuinely enjoy it. Other than them always thinking that I was a genius with tech, everyone was kind and inclusive, and never demanding, which, honestly, was not what I expected when I started there. Anyways, 
So that's just to give a little background as to where I worked. And that was where this story took place. I usually work the normal Monday through Friday, 8am to 5pm shift, with occasional late nights when I wanted to get ahead or if I was behind. At this point, my wife was out of town visiting her mom, so I decided that I would get in some extra work to get ahead of things. There was a new partner coming in, and from what I've experienced, it was going to get crazy. So if I was going to be alone that night anyways, I thought that I might as well get some work done so I could be ahead. So by 5 p.m., I started walking out, and most people were already gone by then as well. I went home, I had dinner, took a shower, and then I went back to the office. By the time that I got back, it was already dark and the parking lot was nearly empty. I buzzed myself in through the two sets of entry doors, and then I used my card again in the elevator to get to the fourth floor. It was pretty dark in the building, with some of the main area lights being motion activated. So, as I walked away from the elevator and down the hall towards the east side of the building where my office was, the lights were beginning to kick on as I passed them. So, saying that I got a bit of a scare when I saw some guy standing by the stairs would be an understatement. I let out a small yelp, but then, trying to be a grown man, I laughed and I just said something like, Oh, <laughs> hey man. The only response that I got back was, Oh, sorry. But he didn't look up from his phone. I just took note of what he looked like and then I carried on towards my office. At first, the guy himself didn't alarm me. He was wearing the green and black striped shirt that our janitors normally wore with black pants. He also had a mop in a bucket with him, so I just assumed that he was one of the janitors working late. I got to my office, leaving my door cracked open, called my wife real quick to give her an update, and then I started working. It wasn't too long after, maybe 30 to 45 minutes, when I started to hear something outside. It was talking, but it was just one voice and the person sounded very angry. I couldn't quite make out everything being said, but there was a lot of sighing and F-bombs. I started getting a bad feeling, so I slowly got up and walked to my door. And listening from the doorway, I could hear the voice a bit more and it definitely sounded like it was a one-sided argument, like someone practicing what they were going to say to someone, if that makes any sense. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong, though I didn't feel comfortable trying to leave. So instead, I quietly shut my door, locking it, closed the blinds on the narrow window by my door, and then I turned off the light. I then went back to my desk and tried to continue working, but also kept getting distracted, listening to the arguing. At one point, I stopped entirely as I could hear someone dragging their feet near my office. I remember nearly holding my breath as I heard doorknobs being jiggled and the sound of the card reader denying access. I didn't have panic attacks or anything of that sort, but that's the only way that I could think to describe how I was feeling at that time. I was starting to feel overwhelmed, and I had this thought that I was in danger, but I just froze. I was hoping that the door lock and access machine would protect me. And shortly after, I heard what sounded like someone kicking the door, shouting some F-bombs, and then walked off. I waited several more minutes before I finally came back to reality and contemplated my next steps. I thought about calling the cops. It sounded like the smart thing to do. 
But even if I did, they wouldn't be able to get past the first set of doors without security buzzing them in. And there was no one on the security post due to the time that it was. So, I would have had to leave my office unprotected just to let them in. I decided to stay behind my locked door and called my wife again to let her know what just happened. But I probably downplayed it a bit, not wanting to worry her. She told me that I should at least call my boss to let them know, and I agreed. I called my boss, and I had to leave a message, and then just waited to see if I could hear anything again. When it was seemingly silent, I tried to open my door and then look out. Again, not hearing or seeing anything. I took this opportunity, leaving all of my stuff except my wallet and phone in the room, quietly letting it lock behind me, and then ran as fast as I could out of the building. I even took the fire escape stairs to not be in the center of the building in case that person was still there. I was able to leave and get home unscathed, but I was still pretty freaked out. The next day, I went into work as normal, prepared to tell my boss about what happened. However, before I could even turn my computer back on in my office, my boss was at my door wanting to talk about my voicemail. I explained everything that happened and I could tell by the look on his face that something wasn't right. He said the janitors were only supposed to be there during normal business hours so he was immediately suspicious when I told them that they were there. Unfortunately, their access cards would still let them in, but the problem was that they all knew that they shouldn't be there. Other than the fact that they were there so late, the rest of the experience was definitely not okay, so he had me go with him to security to review the tapes that night. And what I saw seriously scared the hell out of me. I was hoping I was just being paranoid, but knowing now what was behind that door made me realize that my feelings were warranted, which I think was worse. We watched the footage as the guy scanned himself in, bringing with him the mop and the bucket that I saw. He walked around the two floors he could get to and then had stopped and was looking at and doing something on his phone where I saw him. So long that the lights had turned off. Shortly after that I walked in and saw the guy and then went to my office. That's when the guy continued on going to each office door, trying his badge and of course, being denied access. Janitors were not allowed in the offices unless accompanied by someone with access to that room due to the confidential information. So he even stopped and tried my door. While the fact that he was trying all these doors was pretty unsettling itself, it's what he was carrying that made it all terrifying. The guy was holding a hammer in his other hand. He had left the mop and bucket in the hall and just had this hammer and the badge. You tell me what he was planning on using that hammer for. As I stood there watching this, trying not to flip my stuff in front of my boss, he asked me if I recognized the guy. I confirmed that he was the guy from last night, but I didn't know who he was. The problem was the security guy watching the footage with us didn't know the guy either, which was a problem. They see the janitors all the time and have had to help them with access to some room so they were pretty familiar. But this guy, he was not though. So now, they had to go and review the access logs and see who was trying to get into these restricted rooms, which made things worse. My boss shared with me later that the guy who was there that night did not match the guy whose badge it belonged to, like it had been stolen. Even better, they ended up talking to the owner of the badge because he came in the next day needing to be signed and let in, and he was in a panic because he realized that his badge was missing, 
and he knew exactly what happened to it. It was his roommate. Apparently, he was kicking him out because he wasn't paying his part of the rent anymore. It was his home, and he let his friend, or the roommate, move in with him. He had been stealing some of his belongings, so he told him that he had to go. That night, the guy went on a rampage, destroying things in the house while he was gone and then stole his badge that he kept in his room. I guess he thought he would be able to get in here, steal some things that he could sell or blackmail him for, but he didn't have access to anything like that, which made him angry. I, of course, just became a potential threat since I saw him. The guy whose badge was stolen was reprimanded pretty hard, but he didn't lose his job. He did come up and talk to me and apologize profusely for what happened. I, in no way, had any ill will towards the guy. It's unfortunate that someone he called a friend would do that, but it's also not like he had the badge out in the open. He at least kept it in his room, so other than hiding it or locking it up, what else can a person do, really? He did help in tracking the guy down, though, and he was arrested, so at least we didn't have to worry about him again. That was still one of the scariest things that I have ever experienced. Knowing my gut instincts could have absolutely saved me that night. So to wrap this up, I will just say is to trust those instincts. Even if nothing happens, I think it's a hell of a lot better to be hyper-vigilant than be in a I-wish-I-would-have-done-this situation. Hello everyone, it's your creepy sister here. Thank you so much for watching the video. I really appreciate each and every one of you. But I would also like to thank my amazing patrons, my top tippers, and my dearest channel members. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it with all of my heart. If you want to support the channel further, you could also choose to become a patron, a tipper, or a channel member. But remember, it's appreciated, but never a requirement. I would also like to announce that we have merch now. The link is in the description of the video, along with all my other social media links, like my Discord server, Twitter, Instagram, and others. You can connect with me and send your stories there. And don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't yet, and comments are highly appreciated. And remember, your fear feeds me.